Good morning, church. So, let me ask you a question. We come here on Sundays. Why isn't that every time we come in here, we have an amazing encounter with God? Because He's infinite. He's ever-present. He's imminent. He's here. You'd think we'd come in this space, and we would just be, like, overwhelmed with His presence, right? It's on us. If you seek me, you'll find me. We have to go on a search for him this morning to encounter him. And as we worship, go after him. Connect, let that touch points of the lyrics just touch your heart. Let's stand and sing.
sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I'll worship your holy day. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Thank you. 
compares to this What a wonderful name it is The name of Jesus What a wonderful name it is The name of Jesus Could not hold you, the veil tore before you. You silenced the voice of sin and grace. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory. For you are raised to life again. You have no is the glory, yours is the name above all names, what a powerful name it is, what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ my King, what a powerful name it is, nothing can stand what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. All right, welcome. You made it. We've conquered the hardest day of time change. Welcome to Cornerstone family. Um, would our Kids Zone leaders please, st well, you're already standing. You don't need to stand, but um, if our children ages four through fifth grade, if you could follow your leaders to Kids Zone, have a great time down there. Everyone else, we're up early, have a seat. So if you are new to us, I just want to extend a very warm welcome to you, and we would love to get to know you a little bit. So in the seat back in front of you is what we call our Connect card. This is how we communicate uh, here at Cornerstone for our prayer requests, our praises, um, but also uh, this is a way that we get to know you. So if you could fill that out, and then there are wooden offering boxes in the back of the sanctuary on your way out, just drop that in there. And um, we will uh, send you an email and let you know how you can learn more about Cornerstone and get connected here. All right. So I had the pleasure last week of leading our um, student Bible fellowship uh, to Fort Wilderness. And um, there, it's supposed to be a winter retreat, but as you guys can tell, it's been a pretty mild winter. There was no snow. There was a lot more mud than snow, but we had a great time anyway. Uh, regardless of that, um, you know, playing some interesting things uh, like um, archery tag. <laughs> so if you want to know more about that, it's fantastic, by the way. I'm now Legolos. Um, but anyway, all right, thanks for the uh, small laugh there. But um, I guess it was funnier in my head, I guess. So, uh, But we learned some things about Jesus, and I just wanted to quickly share those with you. Um, we covered Psalm 67, and Psalm 67 says, May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us so that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations, which is amazing as we are coming into the Easter season. But the key takeaways that we had that I wanted to share with you, because I think they're very important, is one is you can know God. What an amazing, amazing truth. That is really, we can know God. He gave us a book, tells us all about him, who he is and what he's about, which is amazing. Uh, the second truth is that we can trust God. 
Amen? Amen to that. And then the third is a challenge. And here's the challenge. God has work for you and I today. And what better way to do that than to invite someone to our Easter service in three weeks, to invite someone to the Good Friday service, a really easy thing so that they can encounter the living God. Amen? Mm -hmm. All right, please stand, and we're going to continue in worship and song. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaken, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus, because he's never let me
I stand when everything around me Hey church, good morning, good to be together with you. Last week I was in Tennessee and the weather was colder than here, it was rainier than here, and I'm like, why did we ever left, leave here? But you know what, whenever I'm away, here's the thing that, that comes to me each time, I miss you and I love you. And if, I, if I haven't told you lately, I want to tell you now, I love you guys. I want to start off and set the sort of the a frame around what we're going to talk about today by sharing a passage of Scripture from Colossians. And I want this verse to just kind of wash over you, okay, as I read it. Listen, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, all things have been created through him and for him. Could underline that. Through him and for him, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And when I hear that majestic passage, I think of the words we just sang, and he, in what he's doing, won't fail. He won't. That's why it makes total sense for you and for me to be giving ourselves into this endeavor of thinking like Jesus and not the culture, in following Jesus and not the crowd, in seeking Jesus and not what's easy, and surrendering to Jesus and not to our feelings, and finally choosing Jesus' way and not the world's way. And in this series we've been going through, we've been seeing how choosing the Jesus way means swimming upstream against the downstream currents of our world and our culture. And we've been talking about pretty consequential things in this series. And this is the second to the last message in this series. And today we're going to talk and focus on a topic that actually represents a full one-third of your life. And that is the topic of work. And so today's message is titled, Your Work Matters to God. And I hope you're, you can get in and, and, and get jazzed about uh, focusing on this subject. I want you to take your Bible, though. You're going to need to take your Bible. And please open it to the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, the foundational passage to, I mean, chapters to uh, our, our world and what we experience. And so let's start by doing some math. The average American works about eight hours a day. That's the average American. But then they also have to drive to and 
from work unless you're remotely working. And the average commute to Milwaukee is 23 minutes, but that's only one way. So if you take into account the drives both ways, maybe you stop for a cup of coffee, you get some gas, well, that's probably nine hours then of your day. But also, you have these to-do lists just about every day in your life. You have to go to the grocery store. You, have, you need to cook. You need to wash the dishes. You need to do some cleaning. You have errands just about every day, which includes uh, not only these trips to take care of things around the house, but you need to pay your bills, and you need to work on your yard if you have a yard. Uh, and if you have a yard, it's great to have three young boys and have a mom who sends them into the yard like I used to have. But I got so spoiled, and now it's just me. And that's why you can find still leaves in my yard today. If we add up all those hours, what would you say is the, the average um, of all, all those hours? I, I did the math. I'm not good at math, but, but I did the math. And if you, if you add in also maybe an hour for eating, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Maybe some of you work out, good for you. But if you add all those hours up, you, you've got about 12 hours in a day. That leaves you four hours before you need to hit the sack. Four hours, the average American uses four hours in front of the TV. So at least four hours of screen time of some kind. My point is this, over the course of a lifetime, even after you factor in weekends, retirement, vacations, the average American spends at least one third of his whole lifetime or her whole lifetime working. In other words, work devours the lion's share of our lives. So you think that's an important topic that God cares about? Now, I realize for some people, work feels like drudgery. It might even feel like a curse. And then for others, you know, um, you, you, just, you just like, work, work is like a um, small g God to you. And so there's those who hate their job, your dread tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. And then for others, you, your work is where you find meaning and satisfaction. You get your identity, self-worth. Work is something like, uh, that you, you kind of worship because work is where you sacrifice. You sacrifice time. You sacrifice energy. You sacrifice, in some cases, your health. Sacrifice your children, your marriage, relationships. For some, th- uh, for some, um, Work is, is something you worship. It may be an oversimplification, so you have a lot of people who see it as a curse, and you have a lot of people who see it as a small g God. And so we need to understand what God's view of the place work holds in our lives. What was God's intention for work? Now, when we look at the foundational first chapter of Genesis, we see humanity's story opens up with this. Chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, do you see it there? God created the heavens and the earth. The very first glimpse we get of God, what is he doing? He's working, he's creating, he's designing, he's engineering, he's inventing, he's sculpting, he's shaping the world. God is a worker. Opening line, God created, God is working. Now look down at verse 26. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. The word rule in Hebrew is radah. The Lord said, let's make man and let them rule over the earth, Rada. It can be translated to reign or to have dominion. It's king language. God's design was for humanity to be a king over his creation, ruling, reigning over the world. Is everybody with me? So before sin, before the fall of man, before the curse, there was work. From the very beginning, God intended for us to work. And when God made man and placed him in the garden, he placed him there to work. Does this surprise you? Have you been of the opinion that work is a consequence of the fall? That's a part of what what resulted because of the fall and because of the separation we experience in relationship to God? Well, look at the next verse in verse 27. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. 
God created male and female, men and women, as partners to work together as kings, as queens ruling over the earth. That's God's assignment to us. And then wrap your mind around what God says next in verse 28. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish and the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. The first thing God does as he engages with humanity is he blesses. Why do you think that's the very first thing mankind experiences from God after being created by him? What we experience is him blessing us because that is what God is like. The, st- the stereotype of a frowning, grouchy, killjoy God, nothing could be further from the truth. God gives us, the very, in the very first chapter of our story, he gives us words of blessing. God blesses them. What did he speak over them? Be fruitful and increase in number. That's a whole other sermon. Fill the earth and subdue it. And our focus today is on the subdue it part because that's what work is about. Subdue. The word subdue in Hebrew is kabash. And it means to wrestle with the earth and wring profit from its hands. God says, fill the earth, subdue, wrestle, bring profit from creation, rule, reign, be steward kings and queens over the earth. Y'all with me? Well, let's move on to chapter 2. Look at verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. This is the first glimpse we have of humans, and they're doing what? They're working. He is ruling. He is governing over creation. He is subduing. He is taking care of the garden. He is wrestling with the earth to create shalom. Shalom is a greeting that the Hebrew people use to wish someone peace, but it literally means that may things be in your world fully as they should be. And so what God commissions here in Genesis 2 is for man to create a space for humans to flourish in God's presence. And so pull the camera lens back. Why are humans created? First off, look back at chapter 1. Verse 26, let us make mankind in our image so that, so that what? So they may rule. We are made to work, to be in relationship with God. It's in our bones. It's in our DNA. It's the core of what makes us human. And that's why, guys, let me ask you, what's the first question a man asks another man when you first meet them? Well, what do you do, right? What do you do? Why is that? Because it matters what you do. What you do for work is central to the role God has given you. That's why unemployment is so gut-wrenching for people. That's why people who hate their jobs or don't enjoy their work are miserable, even if it brings in a boatload of money. That's also why all kinds of studies show this. People who retire early are often very unhappy, and even depressed. You all know people like that who are spending all their time lounging around, spending all their time on the golf course, and they're actually unhappy. I have a story. I hope I have time to share with you later on about that. Because when you stop working, and I mean I, not just a job, I I mean when you stop creating shalom, when you stop inhabiting the role God has given you, You stop being fully awake and alive. Why? Because God has placed this in your bones. You were made to work. So for those who have that that, that thought that work is a curse because of the fall, that's not true. That's not true. In fact, the very first blessing in the story God is writing for us is what? The blessing includes work. In the unfolding story of the scriptures, what we see again and again, and Brian read from Psalms, 
But we see God speaking blessings over humanity. God speaks a whole bunch of blessings, but the first of God's blessings is this, be fruitful and get to work. Subdue, wrestle, reign, rule, labor, take care of the garden I made you to work. Work is a blessing. Work is not a curse. So that's the first uh, reality and the first paradigm we need to to get lined up with when it comes to God's view of work. So church, if we're going to view work as a curse, we'll miss out on its blessing because God's revelation shows us that seeing work as a curse is full on, flat out, wrong. But I did do some research about how people feel about work in our culture. And here's what the data reveals. There's some staggering numbers of when it comes to how Americans uh, feel unhappy about their jobs. Uh, I looked up a Gallup poll, and the Gallup data shows that 32% of, of people in America who, who are at work, um, th- they don't feel engaged. They're just like, eh, just going through the motions. Forbes found this in their polling. It showed that, no, actually it was CNBC, the, the business news channel, and they, and they broke it down like this, they, that 18% are angry at their work, 19 are miserable, 22% are sad, and 50 are stressed. Wow, that that's, doesn't look like the kind of thing that God intended, right? Uh, and then Forbes, they, they say basically half of uh, all Americans are unhappy with their jobs. And each year the numbers actually go up, they don't go down. I wonder if that's, there's a generational kind of thing going on there too. Now a big part of the reason for this can be explained by what happens next in Genesis chapter 3. Again, Genesis holds all kinds of foundational truths about our reality that we experience. Genesis 3 is real helpful in understanding what's behind this experience I just described from the polls. Look down at verse 8 and 9 of Genesis 3. Most of you know the story. Adam and Eve in the garden, they rebelled, and sin enters our world. Watch what happens to Adam. We're told God is walking in the garden, and God calls out to Adam, and he asks, where are you? Now, the woman ate of the fruit, gave it to her husband. He joined in. God comes. They're hiding, and his question is, where, Adam, are you? Think about that questions directed to Adam. I heard you in the garden, Adam responds, and I was afraid because I was naked, and so I hid. And then verse 17 says this, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Meaning because of your rebellion, because of your sin, here's the byproduct, look at it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food. Until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. I want you to notice, because of the, the fall, because of sin, there's a curse, but God doesn't curse Adam or Eve. Notice God curses the land. He doesn't curse Adam. God curses the ground. God curses humanity's relationship with the earth. The curse falls on the ground. The blessing is that humans were made in the image of God to rule over the earth, to subdue and care for the earth and take the creation project forward. But now here's the curse. The curse is that The role that God gave us will be hard. It will not be a cakewalk. You tracking? Now, there will be painful toil. Now, there will be thorns and thistles in the ground and sweat of your brow. Now, the blisters on your hands and sore backs and ibuprofen and icy hot packs and workers' comp. And boy, do I need a vacation. Or in the language of Genesis 3, work involves painful toil. Then listen to this, because the blessing is cursed, God inaugurates in this chapter a plan to restore the blessing 
and save us from sin's curse. As the descendants of Adam, we need to be put back into the right relationship with the Creator and put back into the garden because when he, when they were separated, when they lost their place in the garden, they found themselves outside of the place of flourishing and shalom in God's presence. And so we need to get back with God. And that's not all. We can't stop there. There's more to God's redemption and restoration of what was lost at the fall in the garden. Another facet, another aspect of the saving work of God is to bring us back to a right place, not only with the Creator, but with the role God gave us and with creation itself. Human beings were made by God to rule and bring shalom, not to sit around, which brings us to Jesus. Which brings us to why God steps into the human story and comes to the earth as a what? As a human. He doesn't come in a burning bush. Jesus doesn't come as a pillar of cloud nor a pillar of fire. He comes as a human. Why? To do what Adam was supposed to do. He comes to get this right for humanity. He's restoring back to the the place and to the role God made you and I for. That's what he's doing in our lives. So let me show you this. Go ahead and flip the pages forward to the New Testament. So you go ahead and turn to the letter to the Ephesians in chapter 2. If you're using the chair Bibles, you find it on page 1665, 1665. Ephesians was written by a man named Paul to a church in the city of Ephesus in modern-day Turkey. And what you see all over this letter, and particularly in chapter 2, is how Paul alludes back to the Genesis story we just read. Back to creation, back to the fall, back to sin. He talks about in light of Jesus, here's what we need to know about the interplay between salvation and work. Look at Ephesians 2, verse 8, where he says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Now, sometimes it seems the church becomes hyper-focused on verses 8 and 9, which causes us to be reluctant to talk about the subject of work because Christ's church is about grace. It's about salvation by grace through faith, not by works. Paul here is talking about how you're saved, how you're put back into the right relationship with God. And Paul says, listen, that is 110% grace. And grace literally means a gift. It's an unmerited favor. It's not about merit. It's not about earning. It's not because you go to church. It's not because you're nice or you're kind or you're moral. It's not because you put money in the tip jar. No, 110%. It's by grace. It's a gift. And it's received through the open hand of faith, not of works. But now, if we stop there in our reading of the text, there's a problem. And the problem is we miss the end of Paul's flow of thought. There's no paragraph break in the English Bibles or in the Greek manuscripts. So this is not the end of Paul's flow of thought. If you cut Paul off at verse 9 and you don't keep going, you cut off the crescendo to Paul's point. You're not supposed to cut off Paul's flow of thought right before the climax. For you have been saved by grace through faith. It's climatic and central to what Paul is saying. And we absolutely don't want to diminish in any way, shape, or form what Paul is saying to us there. But he's not done. The climax is verse 10. Look at what Paul says. For you are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do, what's it say there? Good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We need to make this personal. You are God's handiwork. In the original language of of Koine Greek, it's the word poema. Poema is a work of art. It's where we get our word poem from. 
It's, it's this idea, it connotes a masterpiece, this exquisite work of art, created or recreated when you were born again by Christ Jesus. You're recreated in Jesus to do the work set out before you and prepared way back specifically for you to do. Now, what is Paul doing here in verse 10? Well, Paul's clearly alluding back to Genesis chapter 1. In verse 27, God made humanity. He created mankind. And he is saying, listen, Jesus saved you. And he, note the word, created you, which places you back into a right relationship with the creator God. And then he makes this stunning statement. And he puts you back to to work. Doing the good works prepared by God in advance for you, for us, to do good works. If we slowed down long enough to just grasp this and get our minds wrapped around what we're hearing in God's word, good works, what are good works? Here are a few definitions from thinkers I respect. Gary, um, or, or um, excuse me, Jerry Bashirs, who's the head of theology for, the, um, for Western Seminary, he writes, work is the gracious expression of God's creative energy in service of others to create shalom. Work is the gracious expression of God's creative energy working, flowing through us in service to others to create shalom. John Stott, who's awesome, if you ever pick up anything by John Stott, you'll be blessed. He says, referring to Paul and his teaching on good work, He says, the expenditure of energy, manual or mental or both, in the service of others, which brings fulfillment to the worker, benefit to the community, and glory to God. And that's worth repeating. What's the outworking of the good work God's prepared for us to walk in? It brings fulfillment to you. It brings benefit to the community and it brings glory to God. You are made in the image of God, and when God created you and recreated you in Christ Jesus, he made a masterpiece, because God does not make junk. You are a poema, a work of art, because God work is good work. Paul says there are good works, work in service to others, work to create shalom in our world, work to remake things and environments into a place where God's will is done on earth, as it is in heaven. God designed you in some very specific and beautiful ways for good work. He prepared in advance for you to walk in. To walk in. The Bible talks about walking out the life of Christ. It's this idea of progressing. It's this this idea of as we're going along, we're experiencing and also allowing the life of Christ to flow out through us. Not, now, the word used by theologians for that kind of work and that kind of idea is the word vocation. So let's just take a few moments and unpack this concept, this word vocation. It's a word we need to recapture. Down through church history, theologians have talked about the difference between occupation and vocation. And occupation is what you do to make a living It's your job. It's what you do to make ends meet. A vocation, on the other hand, hand, take a sip. Is a calling from God. The word vocation comes from the Latin word vocare, which in Latin literally means calling. Vocation and calling are synonymous. A vocation is work that fits how God shaped you. It blesses others and it glorifies him. Vocation is is what God designed and wired you to do. When you do work that aligns with your calling, you find a deep sense of satisfaction. That was God's intention. He put that in you to be awakened. It's not heaven on earth by any means. And there are thorns and thistles in the ground, but you enjoy it. It's work that fits you. That's true of a stay-at-home mom who works her heart out all day long, employing wisdom and courage and strength and creativity and energy and tenacity. That's true of students, for the students. 
here in, the, in middle school or high school or college or grad school, that's your vocation right now. That is your calling from God. That is your work because you're not learning to get a degree. You're learning to create shalom in the world. And that is true of every good work. And so all the rep- occupations and all the, the energies represented in this room. Look at again at the text. Do you notice Paul doesn't define good works that God has prepared? So could it be that he means designing software? Could it mean, could it be that he means mowing lawns? Could it mean fixing things that are broken and need to be fixed in order for it to bring benefits to others? Absolutely. Yes, I think of my mechanic of the last 30 years. His name is Scott you know, he retired last year, and I told him, do you realize for the 30 years the kind of blessing you've been to my family? How much peace you've brought to us because cars are a big part of life? You know, he, I, I, do you know of many people who get Thanksgiving cards at Thanksgiving? Well, we were known, not just me, my kids, were known for sending him thank yous at Thanksgiving. How many mechanics do you know who receive that. An honest mechanic is something to write home about, right? Could it be that I am called to teach the Bible and Scott is called to fix cars? Could it be my work is good because my work fits me, benefits others, glorifies God? And could it be running Scott's auto service fits Scott and he was really good and, and what he did and how he did the work? He helped so many families. And he told me uh, how other people moaned and groaned when he said he's going to retire. He was a big blessing, and in the end, it glorified God. In the end, it glorified God. Christ followers who are keeping up with Jesus, thinking like him, following him, seeking him, surrendering to him, choosing his way, they don't live for themselves. They realize that the talents God gave them are not solely for their own benefit, your gifting, your skills, your passions, they are meant to make the world a better place. That was God's intention. And the Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, God has given each of you, these are, he's speaking to people who've been recreated in Christ Jesus and born again. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. When God gave you life, he gave you all kinds of gifts and talents and abilities. Those things make you you. And God made you, you. Now, if you've been saved by grace through faith, you've been created through Christ Jesus, and there's nobody like you in the world. And he wants you to be you for his glory. Some of you have an ability to, to, to figure out puzzles and, and do accounting, and some of you are good at math, and some of you are good at closing deals, and some of you are good at music. Some of you are good at organizing. Some of you are, are creative. Yesterday, I received um, an email with a link to a family member, who's Jim's family, actually, who created a lullaby, and I thought it was amazing. I listened to it last night. I knew I, knew I was going to have one less hour of sleep, and I needed to hit and get to sleep, and I'm listening to it. It's, it's beautiful. God made us all different so that everything that's good to do gets done. You are the steward of your talents, and God's intention has been to see you use what he gave you on earth to bless and benefit other people. And by the way, there's something important about your good work that Jesus made very very clear. He says this, if you use these talents and gifts and resources effectively on the earth, then he's going to give you more responsibility in heaven. See, our now is connected to our later. And those responsibilities were going to bring you, are going to bring you great joy. You can see what Jesus talks about through the parables and in all kinds of ways. But here's what he says in Luke 16, 10. He says, whoever can be trusted with very little, and he's ta- here on earth he's talking about, can also be trusted with much in, in our forever home in heaven. You see, did you, did you know life is preparation for eternity? And while you're here on earth, God is developing your character and you're testing your faithfulness. 
Will you be faithful to do the good work God has prepared for you to do, even when you don't feel like it? How you follow through with the work he's prepared for you to walk in will determine what kind of responsibility and role in his kingdom he's going to give you in eternity. For whoever is, can be trusted with very little, and that's what we have here, can also be trusted with much later on. Whatever work God has assigned you, be faithful to do it well. When you get to heaven, God isn't going to ask you, how much money did you make? That's not a question you're going to hear. He's going to ask you, did you align your priorities with mine? How did you make a kingdom difference in the world? How did you express and live out the talents that I gave you? It's a great privilege to partner with God. And that's his invitation. To partner him with him to do good works. Get your mind around what the scripture reveals. I love what God has done. God has prepared good works for me. God has prepared good works for you if you're in Christ Jesus, where you're going to create shalom. It's good work that is epic in its significance. And that's what I want you to leave with here today, to recognize how significant it is that which God has given you. You need to learn to see your work, whatever you do now or will be doing, if your work fits you and benefits others, you need to learn to see your work as your good calling from a good God. Now, I do have to point out, we have bought into some lies about work. And one of them is that we just work in order to earn we, we bought in to this idea, like um, we see in the meme uh, of the seven dwarfs, right? It, the song lyrics go, I, I ho, I ho, I think, right? It's off. It's off. And, and it's been changed, right, in the meme, but I owe, I owe, and that's why I go to work, right? Because that's, work is just to, is a means to an end, but that, that's not true. Work is not a means to an end. In fact, uh, you know, I read this story about a, someone who worked at Disney uh, driving a tram. And people described how they would walk up to the tram. And this guy was so friendly. And he was funny. He was witty. And he breaks all kinds of stereotypes of tram drivers, whatever those stereotypes are. I'm not sure what they are. But that's what the reporter of the uh, story wrote. And, and uh, anyone know a tram driver? Anyone been, been to Disney? Disneyland. The reporter is, is talking to this tram driver at Disneyland, and he asks, have you always been a tram driver? Did you used to drive a bus, or did you drive a train, or something else? And the tram driver answered, well, it's a long story. He says, I was a four-star general in the United States Army. I was the number two in command in Operation uh, Desert Storm under Norman Schwarzkopf. And after the war, I made a bunch of money, and with my military pension, I retired early, moved to Southern California became, because I loved golf, and I played golf for two years. I was unhappy, though, and my wife was even more unhappy with me, and she said, if you don't get a job, I'm getting a divorce. And he then goes on to describe how he started thinking, well, you know, what should I do? And I decided I would, it would be fun to work at Disneyland. And he was happy as a lark after leading tens of thousands of U.S. soldiers to drive out Saddam Hussein from the Middle East. He's now driving parents and kids to the Donald Duck section at Disneyland. Now, why is that? Why is he happy? Because the lie is you work to live. The truth is you live to do work that's meaningful. The truth is you live to do life through meaningful work. The truth is as long as you live, you were made by God to work to great shalom, to make the world into a place for flourishing in God's presence. So the idea of work is only a means to the end. That's a lie. That's a lie. Lots of the work that gets done isn't even compensated at all. And there's a second lie, and, and that's the, the lie where we compartmentalize li our life from our, our spiritual life and our secular life. But that's not the way God sees our life. God view is holistic. So if you were to ask Jesus, how's your spiritual life? If you were going to walk across his path in first century Palestine, or excuse me, the Romans called it Palestine after they destroyed Israel 
in 130 AD. But that's another story. So it's Judea and Galilee. If, but that's a, I really um, took us on a different story there. It's, it's in the news, and I like to be accurate. And, uh, but if you ran into Jesus and you said, Lord, how's your spiritual life? I think, you know, I saw you praying. I saw you going off early. You spent time, you're fasting. Tell us about your spiritual life. And he, I think he would look at us puzzled and say, my what? My What? That's a phrase, by the way, never used one time anywhere in the Bible. Nowhere my spiritual life. You, you mean, he would, he would say, he would respond, you mean my life? The problem is when you think there is a spiritual life as opposed to everyday life, you eject God from the vast majority of your schedule. You push Jesus out because he's over there. He's, he's there at the church. He's, he's there in your Bible reading. He's there in your prayer time. He's not in tech support and software designing, whatever you guys do, which I don't understand, but my laptop is working again, so I thank you. But we think Jesus is not in that. We think Jesus cares about, you know, when we take a lunch break and pray, that's where he's in in that, but when you, you're pulling weeds or laying sod or trimming bushes, he's not there. He's not in the garden. He's not in the dirt with you. But what if that's wrong? What if God is with you, not in the 5% we call spirituality, but in the 100% we call life? What if God is with you in the everyday, ordinary, mundane moments when you're grocery shopping, you're picking up the kids at school, you're washing dishes, you're fixing things on your workbench? What if God is with you there in those moments? And what if what you're doing matters to God? If you're going to live upstream against the cultural currents around us, we need to understand Jesus wants to go with you into every minute of your day. Every, every place where you walk into your world, he wants to imbue your work with meaning because all of life matters to God. He wants to open up your eyes to how he wants all of your life to make a difference because of a life because all of your life, rather, is spiritual. So hear God's calling where you are and serve him. Do you have a landscaping business? Do you, are you a postal worker? Are you someone who teaches and helps kids learn how to speak and how to read? All of life. Because here's what Jesus said, and it's the last scripture I'll share today with you. Jesus says in John 4, as long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Because night is coming when no one can work. So as long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. So now what? What do we do? How do we respond? Well, I'd encourage you to start where you are. Start wherever you are in terms of what do you do now? How do you respond to the good news of God's word? Start where you are and take stock. And then take consistent next steps. Start where you are. Take stock of what, how God has wired you, what God has placed in front of you, and then take consistent next steps and then leave what follows to God. Leave the results to God. You're not responsible for the results. You're responsible for following. And here's what my pastor shared with me because he knew I needed to hear this. And uh, do you know everyone needs a pastor, including pastors? I'm calling this do the works principle of five. Principle of five. Where every day I'm going to do the works while it's daylight. Spend time with God in prayer. Study God's word. Love those closest to me, make a difference in somebody's life, and take care of myself. And that last part was the one I was failing miserably at. But those are the five things every day that you, you, you can be determined to make sure show up in your life. Spend time with the Lord, study his word, love those closest to you, make a difference in someone's life, and take care of yourself. 
Finally, I want to invite you. And by the way, in my role, I have the, the privilege of seeing people come alive in Christ. I get a front row seat when people make a decision to give their life in, to Christ, and they come alive in every kind, all kinds of ways in every dimension of their life. And that's quite a privilege. And this is one of those areas where God invites us to come alive in Christ. I'm going to ask the praise team to come up. And, and as they do, in order to start where you are, I, w- I want to invite you to do some reflecting and talking to God to learn more about how God made you. Start where you are. Take a consistent next steps forward and leave the results to God. But do this in the coming couple days. Ask yourself and the people who know you well, Ask yourself, what gives me the greatest happiness in my work or daily tasks? Where do I see how God has wired me show up in a way where, you know, you you recognize this is something God has made you to do? What gives the greatest happiness in your work or daily tasks? And then what specific talents has God given me? And people around you will tell you. People around you know what they are. They've seen it then how am I using them in my work or my everyday life? How are they showing up in my walking through life? And then lastly, how has God uniquely shaped me to advance in small and in large ways his kingdom purposes? How has he shaped me uniquely? It's, if I don't show up in, to do it, it's not going to get done. Because God has shaped me specifically to show up in this place, in this this area, and make a difference for his his ultimate purposes. Those are fundamental questions you want to be asking about your life. And God wants to answer those questions. So no matter where you're at today, you know what? God is a good God, and he wants to give you answers to the questions because he doesn't give assignments and leave us in the closet in the dark. He shows us the way. He will show you the work he wants you to do so that you can make the rest of your life the best of your life. Would you pray with me? Father God, I thank you, Lord, for how when you created us, you revealed your character. You showed us you are for us. You made us to love us. You made us for relationship and you imbued us with great purpose. And so, Lord, I pray as we come alive in ever-increasing measure to the fullness of life that Jesus came to give us, that we would recognize that you've created us for good work. And Lord, that we would find those places where we can create shalom, where we can find how you've wired us and and allow uh, our work to fit how you made us, where we can benefit and bless our community and others so that For those who are paying attention and have eyes to see, they will recognize the glory that belongs to you. For those who can see, that they'll see in our lives how we point to you and bring glory to you. That's what we want. That's what we ask. We want our lives to count. We do not want to waste any of our lives. And so we ask for the grace we need to do the good work while it is day because night, it will eventually come. Thank you, Jesus for the privilege of partnering with you in that which matters. Uh, Thank you, Jesus. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Would you stand? Let's respond in song. You stood before creation, eternity in your hand. You spoke the earth into motion, I saw now to stand. You stood before my failure and carried the cross for my shame. My sin weighed upon your shoulders, I saw now to stand. What can I say? What can I do? Offer this heart, oh God, completely to you. So I walk upon salvation.
to declare your promise, my soul now to stand. In the midweek this week, I'm going to have a link there so you can also get in on that lullaby I described to you, and so you can share it far and wide with your family and friends. I also put those questions in the midweek. I also put those five principles for work while it is day in the midweek. If you um, are part of our church family and you uh, are ready to, to give, these are the ways we give, and you, uh, you can use the boxes in the back. Uh, since COVID, we don't do any collecting, we give. We don't collect, we give. And uh, that's the way that we can give. Um, next week is the last message in this series. And the title of that message is a message I've been thinking about a long time. And it's titled, It's Not Politics. So we'll see how many friends I have left after next week's message, okay? God bless you. Have a great week.